And our next item is Josh van Dijk, our Vice President of Sales in North America, talking to Peter O'Neill, an industry expert analyst. Peter has witnessed how the market has changed in content management and them tremendously over the past years. So enjoy Josh van Dijk talking to Peter O'Neill. Hi, I'm Josh Van Dyke. I'm the Vice President of North American Sales at SendShare. And, you know, over the last few, uh, over the last year or so, we've had some really major upheavals in the industry. Um, you know, I think everybody's pretty well aware of that. But what it did is it, it really brought to light our, our strategies and the, and the strengths and weaknesses in those strategies really became under scrutiny. Uh, anything from our strategy to our process to even the tools that we use, uh, you know, everything was found out about them. And today I'm speaking with Peter O'Neill, who's an industry analyst who's focused on, you know, all things marketing. I would say he's probably most well known for the 12 years of service that he did with Forrester Research, where most recently he was the uh, research director for Forrester Forrester, including everything related to B2B marketing organizations, process, and automa automations. So <clears throat> also in his last 20 years, he's worked with the Meta Group and Gartner and had a, uh, a pretty long stint with uh, Hewlett Packer, both in Germany and in California. Thank you so much for joining me today, Peter. How are you feeling today? Hey, Josh, I'm feeling fine. Looking forward to this discussion. An exciting yeah. topic at the moment. Yeah, for sure. This is going to be great. So um, today we're going to discuss how things have changed in the uh, content management and dam space and how that affects the vision for the future of achieving that future success. So, you know, I, <laughs> I'd say that, that, Peter, you know, no one kind of wakes out of bed one day and just declares to the world their industry expertise. You know, clearly that takes time and knowledge and, and to build that reputation and that, and that base of knowledge to be able to do that. So maybe you could tell our audience just a little bit about your history and how you got started. Uh, Josh, that's always been a difficult question for me. I mean, when I worked <laughs> at HP, it was pretty easy to explain to people. But now when I meet people wherever, restaurants or on a golf course, and they ask me what I do, and I say I'm industry analyst, they have no idea what that means or what I'm sure. talking about. But I suppose the grounding for my expertise was that first 20 years in various marketing positions at HP, mm -hmm. uh, product marketing, field marketing, corporate marketing. Uh, I worked in Germany only, including in the sales force. I worked on a European level, and I worked with worldwide responsibilities as well. As well. And the other thing was at HP, I was always the marketer who was given the next best thing story to promote. Sure. So I was often needing to evangelize a new topic into the market as well as promote the solution that we were offering from HP. Mm -hmm. and that's probably what encouraged me to switch to the more visionary side of the industry, 2001, when I just returned to my home here in Germany from the HP headquarters in Palo Alto. I, okay. I moved to Metagroup as a consultant analyst, mm -hmm. and that company got bought by Gardner Group, and then I moved mm -hmm. on to Forrester. Mm -hmm. And then in my time at Forrester, I was able to develop some sort of reputation as a, a forward thinker about B2B marketing especially. And I'll nice. give you just one example. I'm infamous for my report called Death of the B2B Salesman, <laughs> which came out in 2015 and actually predicted many of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, and, and you know, uh, automation sometimes does redu reduce that headcount. And, you know, there, there's a lot of analysts out there. Um, and there's a, 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 I feel like your research is, is a bit different, and you take a different approach than some firms. And maybe you could uh, shed some light on that for our audience on, on how, that, how that research differs with, with, with what you're up to. Yeah, I appreciate your saying that. And I left Forrester in October 2017, and I now work independently under my own name. But I mm -hmm. actually, actually have two major business partners or brands that I also work with. One is B2B Marketing, mm -hmm. an organization in London and in Chicago. You, some of those who see the video in big enough profile can see the logo behind me. Yep. Uh, and for B2B Marketing, I do general trends research and write regular premium reports, as they call it, for their members, uh, all of whom are practitioner marketers in various roles, 
across lots of different B2B industries. And the other partner I work with is called Research in Action. And with them, I review the vendor landscapes for various marketing process automation topics. Sure. So our vendor selection matrix reports are perhaps comparable to, to Gartner Magic Quadrants or Forrester Waves. Sure. But they're also very different. Those companies produce a report written purely by the analyst based on conversations with only the vendors that the analyst selects to work with mm. includes in the report. Our difference mm -hmm. is that we first survey the market. We interview yeah. 1,500 business decision makers each time before then adding our own analysis. And the scoring schema for each vendor position or vendor matrix is 63% market data and just 37% analyst data. Hmm. And our reports are also based on a global survey. And we yeah. capture many vendors outside of the US. And now the research group that I managed at Forrester, we had 11 yeah. analysts and all of them were in the US. <laughs> and even right. if they knew about European vendors, they would still really only care about them if the vendors had good coverage, a good customer base in the US market. Mm -hmm. So last but not least, we actually publish a 90% version of the reports each time for anybody on our website. And we usually get thousands of readers per report on that website. Mm -hmm. A Gartner Group or Forrester report is behind a paywall and typically yep. gets a few hundred subscriber reads each time. So we like to claim that we're actually democratizing, democratizing, that's the right word, democratizing <laughs> the research process. Nice. I like that. I like that. I mean, there's a lot of, there's definitely a, a different uh, approach to the, to the reporting. And, you know, when you're, when you're surveying all these different uh, people in the market, you, you get to feel for what the market is up to in some of the changes that are happening in some of the trends. And, you know, this year, as everybody knows, we've seen a lot of changes. Right. Oh. Um, so in terms of companies and, and the changes you've seen in the industry and where people have had to pivot, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about what you've seen over this past year. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, I've been interviewing many marketing executives for my B2B marketing research projects. Uh, and I've actually also been working together with some client companies on their content marketing strategy. So I would say that I've been saying, seeing two major trends, both of which have really always been underway, but at a much slower rate. Mm -hmm. The first, well, the first is the importance of digital marketing, digital selling, and e-commerce. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that two years ago, every company would have admitted they were facing, planning, or perhaps even undergoing a digital transformation. That was sure. the buzzword at the time. But actually, within the companies, many individuals, company executives, and especially sales executives, they were also assuming that this transformation would take time and they did not have to change mm -hmm. anything yet. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. the COVID-19 crisis has been a tidal wave that has washed away many of these change management crabs. And digital has become the primary way now of doing business. So there's one. The other mm -hmm. major story <clears throat> is the tonality of marketing and selling content. The most immediate reaction already apparent in early 2020 of most companies, marketing and even sales departments was to focus on helping customers instead of selling to them. Mm -hmm. Messaging mm -hmm. and content began to include serious considerations of the customer experience. There's a new mm -hmm. term. Mm -hmm. And trying to solve a customer's problem became the overriding priority for both marketers and sellers. Now together, this has resulted in an overall pivot to optimizing the customer experience that marketers are providing. Yep. The customer experience is a combination of the information that you communicate and the media that you deploy for the communication. And both of these need now to be exactly what the customer is expecting at every time. If it's not, they'll switch or click away very quickly. Sure. Yeah. You know, you talk a, a bit about how the content has changed and, and I would agree with you, but is there anything that you've seen in terms of content systems, how that has changed? Oh yeah. So um, content uh, marketers have now had to deploy much more complex systems than maybe they were thinking about two or three years ago. There's mm -hmm. been a massive change now from creating sales content, which was the old way to now working on providing more helpful useful and compelling content to buyers and customers. Mm -hmm. So I've even seen a significant increase in the number of thought leadership programs being set by companies. Mm -hmm. And of course, the other thing has been the increasing variety 
of content types now being produced. There's a growth in the provision of webinars, videos, and other rich media types of content. Yeah. Consumer companies that used to perhaps show two pictures per SKU on a website are now creating and presenting 10, 12 digital images per product. Even B2B companies who sell complex products like machinery now want to present that in rich media to replicate the deep dive demos that buyers might have enjoyed by visiting the factory. And the interesting thing is, as these objectives are achieved through the technologies that are possible now, they're being perceived as preferable to the old way of working by both buyers and sellers alike. Right. I mean, marketers were originally wary of producing video you know, because they perceived it as expensive to produce. Mm -hmm. Because they were thinking they had to produce almost TV-like quality. Right. Now we're all used to doing these types of video conferences, and we've all realized it's okay to have this quality. Right. And even TV programs use these platforms for their interviews now. Right, right. Yeah. Now, in B2B companies especially, there has also been an explosion in, in sales enablement projects, where marketers now worry about the content that their sellers are using and presenting, and they want to make this content available on digital platforms to support the seller having online meetings with buyers instead mm -hmm. of meeting face-to-face. -face. And the most important knock-on effect of this has been that there's now much more appreciation of marketing's contribution and the value of marketing content, especially if it's augmented with customer insights, of course. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because... <clears throat> You know, when everything went remote, there was a lot of people even in, in television that are producing hot, super high quality. They have these great cameras, but now, hey, people are at their houses, right? Uh, and so, you know, where it was a one-off where you might interview somebody and they were on a Zoom call, this became the whole program at one point. And so producing something of, of that level, people are more accepting of it. They're more interested in the content than the thrills. Yep. Um, you well, know, and we go to is a put on a decent shirt, but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, you know, in terms of content architecture, um, you know, kind of that vision for the future that you have, you know, what, what are you seeing out there? Well, first thing I'm thinking of is, is organizations. Uh, most modern CMOs, let me call them that, are now establishing content teams with, with planners, editors, mm. creatives, and also people specialized in content distribution. I mean, uh, as these groups become more experienced, you actually see their content plans include content reuse or atomization, where a bigger piece of content can be recycled into smaller cuts over a longer period of time. Mm. It's actually a competency that you have seen in marketing agencies in the past or, or in magazine and the newspaper industry. It's now becoming a marketing skill as well. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised to see some software systems coming out automating this process in the future. Sure, sure. And maybe we even do this with, uh, with, with this interview here, right? Uh, take a couple of it and make some micro clips out of it. You're free to do that. I'm trying to make sure this pause is in between each conversation. There uh, you go. <laughs> my observation is also that, that many companies are now realizing they do need a more holistic content architecture that incorporates... Mm -hmm the contact text or copy itself, mm -hmm. all the digital media assets that can be included into the content. Yeah. Plus data about the consumer of the content to ensure personalization and relevance. Remember mm -hmm. the customer experience is so important now. Mm -hmm. I mean, historically, most companies have maintained different systems, had different teams even for content management, digital asset management and product information management. A CMS yeah. here, a dam over there, a PIM down there different systems with different teams. And because each team has their own system, they tend only to work in that system. And their idea of integrating or collaborating with other colleagues would be to have uh, some sort of interface between systems as opposed to them actually working together. Sure. But it's no longer effective to treat these things in their own silos. Yeah. And that's one level of integration. Then mm. there's the other layer, how to render the content or content mix to digital visitors especially. People talk here about digital experience management process. And I'm seeing a general trend to a separation of the content layer and the presentation layer, which often gets labeled as headless architecture by the software vendors involved. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because it does seem like, 
you just can't treat things in a silo, right? Uh, I mean, you can, but not if you want to have kind of maximum effectiveness. And you, you, you kind of touched on that as uh, you have a, a lot of things kind of merging together, right? Um, and do you see that happening as, as a kind of a future trend where things are more merging together in this omni-channel world? I do. And uh, there's, for example, there's uh, the whole area around um, lead management systems or what were often called over the last part, a few years, marketing automation platforms. Um, okay. The architecture of those systems is changing quite radically. They used to be just basically the collectors of leads, maybe an orchestration of a campaign, and then the lead would be processed so that it could be passed on to the sales force. Now we're starting to see functionality in those systems that mm -hmm. are combining the interactions to the data management systems, digital data, content data, customer data, customer insights data, and, and then interacting with the presentation on interfaces such as the digital experience systems, all coming together as one larger, mm. what I'd like to call engagement management platform. And we're going to start to see some new types of vendors and some new types of solutions over the next few years. I know that from conversations I'm having already with some of those vendors. Yeah. And, and I've seen that in the marketplace where, you know, other vendors are trying to acquire other softwares to try and make that more holistic uh, look. Not it doesn't always work because uh, yeah. those softwares don't always talk to each other very well. Um, but you can see that you can see that happening in the marketplace already. Yeah, and a lot of the movement and velocity is coming from the vendors that actually have a lot of momentum with e-commerce and presenting products in an e-commerce environment. Um, they are the ones that are actually investing the most at the moment in these other areas, as opposed to the traditional Marketo or Eloqua platforms that were out there. And we're the leaders, but probably won't be in the future. Right, right on. And you, you just see that uh, in terms of effectiveness working together uh it's not just that the content is there but now the people are there the people are all on the same platform the people are able to interact and uh, especially when you used to be able to walk down the hall and say hey can you look at this um being able to work in that same system seems to have a, a greater effect on that efficiency um that's going to be very important and i mean how often do you see um martech stacks or inventories of different software products within a marketing organization bought from various vendors. They have different mm. interfaces. They sometimes use different taxonomy or terminology for the same thing. Uh, and it's very difficult for the marketers to communicate with each other if the systems are telling them different information. Sure. Uh, so there, there really has to be a push within all marketing organizations to, to standardize those efforts. Yeah, I was uh, working with a with a, a, a company in California, um, you know, that we we actually brought on uh, recently, and they were saying that when you talk about information being different in different systems, you know, they 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 didn't have a, a real single source of truth, and what they were finding is that the information that was in their ERP about a product and the information that was uh, in a website or uh, you know in a product brochure or in a manual, it didn't line up. Over 70% yeah. of the time, they did an audit 70% of the time that there was a difference between, you know, their ERP and somewhere in the process of, you know, the output uh, of the dimension of, of that product or some sort of language in there, there was something wrong. And if someone's going to order 30,000 of something and, you know, put it in, you know, this whole building, then you got to make sure that the dimensions are right. Right. <laughs> that could be bad news. Yes, of course. And upset the whole customer relationship. And, and, and Joss, I mean, I'm talking a very sort of high level about many of these trends, but some of these reports that I produce at the vendor selection matrix reports, and we don't just survey the vendors. We actually survey what marketers are thinking, uh, what their challenges are, their areas of interest around a particular topic. And uh, you just mentioned a, a very strong challenge in the PIM area, product mm -hmm. information management area. Mm -hmm. the, the, there is a massive, that is the number one driver for investment at the moment in new PIM projects. And that mm. is to establish that single source of truth. Yeah. Um, the, the report I'm currently talking most about, though, to be honest, in speeches, workshops, webinars, is one that I did about three months ago on account-based marketing, ABM. Yeah. Uh, but I did a vendor selection matrix on, on DAM, digital asset management, about two okay. months ago. Nice. I'm about to publish the one on PIM this month. Nice. Next month, actually, I have an initial survey research back now already. I'll be writing a report on what I'm going to call the process of brand 
Content Management. Let me call it BCM, Brand okay. Content Management. And, and that's the sort of holistic process that I talked about a few moments ago where you have to, all these different content systems have to come together. I actually did my first version of that report two years ago. Okay. And I remember I had to explain what I meant by BCM to many people, both users and vendors alike. But this year in the survey, I found that most marketing practitioners have understood what I meant by brand content management intuitively. Mm -hmm. They want to manage a process that manages all their content work, plus enables them to ensure their brand message is consistent through all the channels, including third parties who represent their offerings, for example. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, Sendshare came out strong in the Adam report. Nice. And the initial results show that they're also recognized as being very good for BCM as well. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. And, you know, and you're touching on the reports and, and maybe you could, you know, are there certain kind of metrics that you're using in those reports um, or things that you're basing it on? Um, maybe you could dive into a little bit more specifics for the audience. Okay, well, the, the survey has sort of a structure and that is that we kick off the survey by defining the, the process. And we need to do that because, I mean, compared to Gartner and Forrester, what we study is actually how do you automate a business process, a marketing process? We don't talk about categories of technology. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't have that approach, an IT-centric approach. We have a, a business-led approach. So we talk about sure. the process, we define it to them, and then we ask them to think about the process and identify the major drivers for investing in automation, their major inhibitors, problems getting the project approval, uh, through management, sort of issues like that. And then we would say, oh, which vendors do you know in this area? Do you know enough about to give us feedback about? And then they normally name one, two, sometimes three, but I think the average is 1.4 per respondent. Right. So we get feedback about a vendor for that topic, and we ask them about what you think of their products, what you think about their strategy, what you think about their go-to-market approach, do mm -hmm. you think they have a vision, do you think that they're innovative? What about the quality of their support? Do you have customer satisfaction? And we even ask them a sort of yes, no question. Would you recommend this vendor to appear to be using that product? So a recommendation index, we call that. Wow, okay. And that's the data that we collect. And that's the 63% of, of uh, scoring that the survey tells us. And then I go to the 15 or 20 vendors that have the best scores in the survey, and I say, sure. I'd like to talk to you, brief me please, and then based on the briefing, I can do my scoring of their go-to-market strategy, their product roadmap, and actually I personally pay a lot of attention to the um, investment and the organization that companies are now setting up, and then bear in mind, most marketing software these days is software as a service, so I pay particular attention to the investments that vendors are making in customer success. Sure. Having customer success teams, are those customer success teams just people who call at the end of the year and want to renew the contract? Are they people who are just there for the first two months to make sure the software is running? Yeah. Or are they actually people who have industry experience, who can go to the customer throughout the year or two years and make suggestions about where to deploy the software that's much better, how to be much more productive with the software? Really practitioners with lots of experience. And then for me, that's how I try to judge the vendors and how I score them high or low. Right. Yeah. And not, not just someone who's calling you every quarter and saying, uh, can you add more users, but instead actually having someone who's more of a, a visionary right. saying what's going on in your business and, and, and right. how can we, how can we make it better? And how can we, we, we shift with you to, to, to enable you invest, serve and support you. Have you thought about doing this? We've heard from other clients that they use it in this way. What about you doing that? Yeah. Right on, right on. You know, you mentioned, you know, kind of future investment, um, you know, and everybody's always interested in, in kind of w what things you see in the future. Um, you know, so in terms of the future of content, uh, is there any big kind of paradigm shifts that you're seeing uh, or any big trends that you're seeing? Um, on the one side, definitely content is much more than just blogs or text. It's become now very much multimedia, rich media. Mm. Um, I mean, but bear in mind that the biggest shift for marketing is that they're moving away as an organization from just being a mere collector of leads, which are then passed on to the sales force. Now, because of the advent of digital marketing, 
ABM concepts, customer experience demand, um, marketers are focusing more and more on engagement marketing. Sure. Supporting rich relationships which provide information, support discussions, and meet the information standards of the modern buyer, which are you know an Amazon-like dialogue, mm. helpful business-orientated content, and rich media. Mm. And all those things will require a whole new generation of content platforms. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And you know, uh, there's there's probably some people here, uh, you know, that that will watch this on our, in our audience and, and say. You know, we're we're looking at procuring a new system. Um, we're looking at a new content system or a new dam system, or maybe something you know, uh, you know, more robust where it kind of touches a lot of different points and will involve many different departments. Um, yeah. Maybe you have some advice for people who are looking to you know procure a new system. Yeah, sure. So I mean, generally across the dam and the PIM surveys that we did, uh, around twenty five percent are looking for a new brand new system. They're starting that project for the first time. And another 25% are actively now looking for a replacement or mm. consolidation of existing systems because the existing systems uh, don't satisfy the current demand. Right. Now, well, when I help clients in their vendor selection process, I, I like to stress two important factors. Uh, and one is, 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 as you just said, the understanding that their selection should be based upon a, upon a longest term strategy around right. the processes that they're automating. Marketers can't afford anymore to buy software for just one process only or for just one team in the organization. It, it must fit together. Um, there needs to be someone or a team of somebodies who are planning the complete marketing stack as a strategy. Usually in large organizations, there's a marketing op operations organization and the leader of MOPS is now the person taking responsibility for the MarTech strategy and the market architecture. Okay. Now, the other thing that I encourage often when uh, in vendor selection process is to, to have a design thinking approach to vendor selection. By that, I mean that there, there should be a, a collaborative approach involving all users, all different users in the organization, management, including procurement, legal, finance, and of course, the management in marketing as well, plus the vendors towards getting towards the right decision. So instead of just having an easy process that it used to be of having a long list of specs and getting the vendors to provide a proposal against those specs and then making a selection on the desk, I, sure. I encourage a more staged process. Cut the list down as quickly as possible to so just two or three vendors. You know, Base that upon rough product suitability and, and also compatibility between your organization and the vendor. Mm. And then run a more detailed test scenario with each of those vendors. And by that, I mean create a prototype. Bring the staff together, the staff from your team and the staff from the vendor or its implementation partner. Test for friction in the relationship. Stretch the goals. Really find out if the vendor that you're choosing is suitable to work with for a couple of years. Sure. And I advise strictly against choosing a vendor because you're impressed by the vendor sales team. <laughs> or their promises, uh, or perhaps the price. And also, just because you as a manager chose a vendor in your last job does not mean that it's the best fit for your new employer. So right. that's also not a reason to select a vendor either. You'd be amazed yeah. how many products have been sold on that basis. So design thinking is a, is a process itself, and it applies very much to this, this vendor selection process as I see it. Yeah, you, you mentioned a couple of really cool things there, you know, that I, 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 I picked up on. One is involving some different departments, right? Uh, and as, as we talked earlier about things kind of moving together, emerging together in an omnichannel world, that's going to involve different departments and different people and different use cases. And architecting, what are those use cases, right? What are the things that we do in, in saying, hey, vendor, show me how you do that in your system? Um, but also, it, it also sounded like maybe having a bit of a North Star of not just what you're doing today or the pesky problem you need to solve today, but yeah. how do we see this evolving over the next two and three and four years? That's it. That, that vision has to be there. You have to know where you're going. Uh, and, you know, marketing, most marketing automation projects, um, they buy one or two applications from the, the classical marketing automation vendors and that application actually fulfills about 70%, maybe 60% only, of the needs 
that were documented. The rest is then put together through some sort of low code developments using Creasio or a Pega systems or whatever else is around to fill in those gaps, mm. uh, to, 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 to join a process from one application to another application. The process as the marketer sees it, as the business sees it, is very often more than the process that's defined within a single application that's been offered to the marketplace as a piece of standard software. So sure. the, the whole story is much more complex than the software market is providing. And so yeah, some, maybe a bit of flexibility as well with the oh, vendor yeah. and, and the software that, that, that the vendor is representing that you can actually, uh, you know, as your business changes and morphs and grows, that the software can actually do it. It's not so rigid that they can, yeah. you, can, you can build things out within it. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, way back for 40 years ago when I was at HP designing software, we had the concept of customization. Um, SAP copied it from us and, and created R3 with all their customization possibilities around R3. Uh, it became a monster for SAP to maintain because obviously every time they brought out an upgrade, that was a monster project for every customer. Um, but the technology has moved on now 40 years later with software as a service, with uh, the methodologies that now get deployed in, in writing code and developing code, making systems flexible enough that customers can customize for themselves is definitely possible. And uh, those will be the successful software solutions in the future. Right on, right on. Well, <clears throat> you know, Peter, any final thoughts, um, you know, for, that you want to leave our audience with today, you know, something you know to be true? <laughs> um, I would think that, I mean, the, mar the marketing ops people, those people responsible for marketing technology, I mean, it's going to be their responsibility in very many companies to sort out quite a mess of technology, stuff that's been bought over the last five to 10 years um, by many people who are no longer within the organization because they've moved on to other things or other companies. Um, the mops people have to be prepared to throw software out. Um, mm. Just as through the trivial tests, like switch it off and see what happens. You'd be surprised how how few complaints will be coming into the MOPS <laughs> organization because something isn't running. Uh, the software isn't being used at all. A lot of it has been installed. Maybe four or five users played around with it and then gave up again afterwards. So mm. um, the, the biggest tip I'm giving to many MOPS people, technology people at the moment is they really audit your software and audit it not just by asking people if they're using it, but try it out, switch it off, and then wait two weeks to see if there's uh, any hot sites developing or any rude telephone calls coming in. And uh, <laughs> lo and behold, you'll find many of the cases that it's not being used at all. Sure, sure. And if you get a call, uh, 15 calls in the first 15 minutes, you know it's valuable. That's what right? we can find out, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, if our audience wants to reach out to you or if they have questions for you, uh, or actually also in addition to that, if they want to see some of the reports that you're producing, where would they see those reports and what's the best way to get in touch with you personally? Okay, they can find me, of course, in LinkedIn under my, under my name, but uh, my, my own website is... Uh, a website called marshnatter.eu. I'm not too sure if people can see it up there. Sure. Marshnatter is Welsh, so people can learn Welsh with me. It's uh, the, the month of March, then N-A-T-A, -A, and then .eu. And that's a website where I maintain uh, copies of the reports. I do regular blogs on that website. I usually have examples of my other output that I do for other clients in there. Uh, so that's a good source of information for people who are trying to sort of look at stuff that O'Neill is producing. Last but not least, I, I take emails uh, with pleasure from anybody who wants to write to me. My email address is poneil, P-O-N-E-I-L-L, -L, at, guess it, marshnatter.eu. So if anybody wants to write to me with feedback and uh, questions, I'd love to hear from anybody. Oh, I love it. I love it. And, and, and just out of curiosity real quick before I let you go, um, what, is, what does Marshnatter even mean? Ah, so Marsh Natter. So I've been living over here in Germany since 40 years, but actually my origin is Wales, mm -hmm. part of Great Britain. I always tell people it's the great part of Great Britain, but look at there this you go. there. Uh, but Marsh Natter is the Welsh word for marketing. And okay. curiously, nobody has developed a website with uh, Marsh Natter as a title. So I, I grabbed it for myself and set it up about three years ago. Great. Going back to your roots. I like it. Well done. Uh, 
Peter, thanks so much. This has been really valuable. Uh, really appreciate you joining us today. And I'm sure there was a lot for our audience to take in. So uh, thank you again. Josh, all the best. Thank you. All right. So that concludes our first Ecosphere Day. As our CEO Esther Donuts told today, it's different this year. It's online and the world has digitalized even more than ever before. So we will continue to push our product into new areas of innovation while staying committed to our current users and partners. Big innovation comes when our customers move to the cloud, as you saw in Alexander Reutinger's talk to AWS. And Sensure continues to be in the middle of your content ecosphere. An amazing presentation by CI Hub, one of the most successful connectors in the dam space. Thanks a lot also to Philadelphia Orchestra, Tourism Ireland, ReWorld Media and Oriflame for some great presentations. Philadelphia Orchestra, one of the best orchestras in the world, has ventured into a bunch of innovations and that's needed to manage hundreds of terabytes of videos. So what's up tomorrow? It's facelift, MCOM and auto retouch. An auto retouch is an absolute must see. No more editing of thousands of pictures by hand, but making your pictures ready for PIM by artificial intelligence. And of course, we have our keynote speaker, Steven van Belleghem. Steven talks about what has happened the past year. We have leaped forward seven years of innovation. And of course, enjoy our customers, Lensend, Argus Media and AZL. For now, we are transitioning to the after show with some live cooking. So go to the left side of the terrace at the barbecue station.